much about time. We'll break off for lunch at around the correct time. Um, staff and students know they may have to be shorter. Guests will get their proper amount of time. Right, so our, our next speaker, I'm sure, can introduce himself extremely well. We're very proud to have you and a very interesting concept of transnational law within one continent. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Felicity, and uh, thank you. I pay my respect to the allodial title holders of, of this land, the Larrakia people, and to their ancestors past and present. In saying that, in my own language, I say kai. Nalu binji gal yuku namana. An ancient and allodial oceanic sense of what is right and wrong permeates this land. Now, with that, I have to say the um, revolutionary in me or the activist in me is very tempted to go right off track here this morning, having listened to what I've listened to. <laughs> Dr. Leonthal says, go for it! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will keep this a simple IRAC presentation and we'll keep to the point. So uh, we're, we're talking about genocide. I think we need to go back one slide. Oh, here, please. Oh, we'll see. Yeah, thank there you very much. Trans transnational genocide in Canberra. And you, you think of um, Canberra as being part of Australia, um, and uh, you know, well, clearly it isn't. And I'll explain that if we could go to the next slide now, that would be fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. So, Gumal Nation um, and England here, we see uh, the two nations involved in this. The Gumal Nation, um, Gumal Ngambri people, are the people Canberra is named after. And uh, the Gumal Nation extends from Orbost in Victoria up the Great Dividing Range until the northern end of Wirrawa, Lake George, um, near, near a town called Goulburn. It's uh, an area that goes out to Wagga Wagga to the west and to the escarpment of the Great Divide uh, looking out over the Pacific Ocean. So it's quite a large area, I suppose. I suppose it, it's, it's about the size of a small uh, European nation like England. And like England, it has a number of provinces, six provinces. So, uh, and we speak the same Gumal language. Gumal means mountains. We're high country people. And uh, that's where things start. So um, our nation has never ceded its allodial title. We are the allodial title holders to that land. And uh, we've never surrendered that title. Um, the Australian government has no evidence of having acquired the allodium to the land. And so it remains with our people. We are an independent nation within this great continent, as is every other allodial nation mm. in this country, because there isn't one nation in this country that has surrendered their allodial title. Give you some food for thought for you. Allodial in Zephyr is spelled A L L O D I A L if you'd like to use that up. We can have the next slide. Yeah. Great. So, today we're going to look at the rules of law from Antic and, and uh, against Carrington. It's a very famous case um, that um, really epitomises what this particular struggle is all about. We're going to look at the structural rule of genocide. And then we're going to follow on and look at the relevant provisions of the a ACT ordinance, the ordinance number eight, which is the ordinance about Aborigines in Canberra, signed by Queen Elizabeth II in 1954. So a very interesting uh, area to look at. And uh, if we can go to uh, Entick and Carrington, uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And here we see Entick versus, or Entick against Carrington. The, the Home Secretary issued an unconditional warrant. An unconditional warrant. It's a, a very interesting <coughs> term. And Lord, Lord Camden held as follows Every invasion of private property 
be it ever so minute, is a trespass. So this, this particular ethic uh, against Carrington case uh, is the basis of um, all warrants, all arrest warrants. So it's a, an interesting case for you to, uh, to examine, to read and to get to know. Uh, Lord Camden uh, also went on to say, no man can set his foot upon my ground without my license. But he is liable to an action, though the damage be nothing, which is proved by every declaration in trespass, where the defendant is called upon to answer the bruising, answer for the bruising of the grass, and even treading upon the soil. So, on the level of international law, arguably a trespass is cognate to an unlawful invasion. An unlawful invasion. And that's what we have with the English trespassing on the Gumal nation. An unlawful invasion. So if we could go to that next slide, please, Lucy. Thank you. So there we have the situation with the United Nations uh, Convention on Genocide, Article 2, the elements of which state deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Now, just to go back a step, Australia signed that convention in the United Nations in 1948 and ratified, ratified it in 1949. So Australia has acknowledged this as international law and then the Queen by signing the ordinance, the ACT ordinance number eight has in fact committed a further genocide. As you'll see, when you look at what ordinance number eight is all about. If you go look at, let's just break this down for a minute, deliberately inflicting, these are the elements that we're talking about, deliberately inflicting. And you look at what that term means in terms of law, what's taking place, they were aware of what they were doing. They deliberately inflicted this. On a group, a group being what, two, three or more people, a group doesn't have to be a large you know, volume of people, it can be a small amount of people. And when the first settlers arrived in 1821 on my land, they noted that there was anything up to a couple of thousand people on the land that they came to settle. And in fact, the first settler named his property Canbury after the local people. So the fellow named Joshua John Moore. To look at conditions of life. So they're deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life. Inflicting their own conditions, English conditions, upon a very sophisticated group of people who since the beginning of time had a, a established way of being that was so sophisticated the English didn't recognise that it was a system. We had a law system. We had a judicial system all in place. We had a communication system. We had a method of farming. So sophisticated, the English didn't recognise it as being farming. So they're, they're inflicting their own conditions by you know, taking our able-bodied men and getting them to go out and destroy their own country. That's a typical example of what happened. As calculated to bring about, calculated. What does calculated mean in this instance? So calculated could be you leave your home, you stuff a banana in your bag and you walk out the door. So the banana slips out of your bag, you don't know, but somebody following you walks along and slips on the banana 
and hits their head and dies. You know, what's, what's that position for you now? You know, that's calculated. That whole situation of that man's death was calculated upon those terms. Then we look about its physical destruction. The physical destruction not only of our people but our land. So the land of the people within eight years of the introduction of sheep, for example, was a complete obliteration of our habitat. Where yams were as important to our people as rice to Asians or corn to American Indians, all of that was removed. And even today, there's less than 1% of unaltered indigenous grassland on this entire continent. That's happened in the last 227 years, ladies and gentlemen. Very short space of time by comparison to the tens of thousands of years that our people live here in harmony with the landscape, in unison with one another, and very peacefully. Yeah, our people traded with Indonesia since the beginning of time, very peacefully. Yeah. And we look at in whole or in part, in whole or in part is that final element of that element, that Article 2 of the UN Genocide Convention. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you there we go. So here we come to Ordinance Number Eight of 1954, signed by Queen Elizabeth II, the current so-called Queen of Australia. So, for the purposes of this section seven, sorry, purposes of section seven of this ordinance, and the last preceding section, a member of the police force or a person authorised in writing by the Minister shall have access to all reasonable, at all reasonable times to an Aboriginal at any place which he, which he is residing or employed and may make such inspections and inquiries as that member or person may think fit. <coughs> This sounds like the ending and character, the ending and character you know, fact pattern, doesn't it? When you think about that, and the the ending and character fact pattern has just been repeated and repeated and repeated right through this entire ordinance. So it's interesting that it's it's also gender biased, and that these people are being instructed by the minister or the police. The minister could instruct anybody. He can pluck a person off the street and say, I want you to go down there and, and rip that bloke out of that house because I've told you you can do it. You have my permission to go and do that. So it's, it's a very, very rough law, a very rough treatment that's been impacting our people and still impacting our people today. You know, you think back and in, in, just go back one slide there if you would Felicity, just for a second, the, the physical destruction in whole or in part, the removal of children, which is still going on today, is very much a part of this entire case, you know, depriving our people of the, the fundamental <coughs> right to bring up their own children. You know, it's, um, it really has a, a great deal to answer for. Queen Elizabeth has a great deal to answer for. So we can go yeah. forward. Thank you. So, okay. Okay. so yes, here we are. So, here we have the application and the conclusion to this story. As I said, I would keep it fairly brief. On the basis of what Lord Camden said in Antic and Carrington, when he prohibited the tyranny 
of arbitrary and capricious administrative power, Section 10 of the Ordinance appears to breach Article 2 of the Convention. Very straightforward, isn't it? The simple argument. This is because the unfettered authority to deal with persons of Aboriginal men is a warlike attack on the conditions of life. Oh, God, those graphite are too exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a minute, they're coming. I, I, I don't find it exciting, I find it troubles. Well, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, ignore the levity, you know what I mean. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yes, thank you very but much. I, yeah, very forgiving. To, to conclude. Next slide. Or please. Yeah. Oh. oh, no. We're going to have a little freeze frame. Oh, no, freeze. That's all right. Okay. There we go. Oh. That's it. That's it. That's exactly oh. the slide. Oh, I want. <laughs> That's exactly the slide I want. Thank you very much. We've concluded. To to conclude, Australia has a lot to answer for. Queen Elizabeth, in particular, the Queen in your time, has a great deal to answer for. Our lodial nations stand proud. And we remain in this land as independent nations. Therefore, what I pose to you today is a transnational crime. A transnational crime between England, the Queen of England, in fact, and the allodial people of this land, and in this instance, the Gumal Nation. Thank you. Any questions? Thank yes. you. Quick one. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, thank you very much. That was a very uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Especially uh, what, one thing that uh, probably in our, our discussions here is what is the next step, really? And what is the next step uh, with, with your situation between your people and these laws that have been made in the, in the um, early 19th century? It applies to many things happening worldwide also. But for your situation, I'm imagining. Is there much more after Kevin Rudd made that uh, a statement in 2008? Is there much more uh, that can be pursued, not necessarily by legal affairs, but what is the next uh, step that is that is expected? Certainly, Kevin Rudd's apology to victims of, or to to uh, victims of the stolen generation is uh, to a very minute section of our community. It wasn't at, at all an apology to all allodial people in this land. Um, it was an appreciated apology but it has done nothing, not a thing, to stop children from being taken from their families. In fact, to this day, there are far more people, far more children being taken from their mothers today than there ever has been, despite the apology. The apology was, was empty words. You know, there was no compensation to a single person as a result of that apology, nothing. You know, the rest of the world think, oh, isn't it wonderful? Australia has apologised to all these little people that they've stolen and that they continue to steal, but there was nothing. It was empty words. So, you know, our next step is simply this. We have a local title to our land. We don't need their native title legislation. Their native title legislation means absolutely nothing. It's just paper you can rip up and flush down the toilet because we have a logical title. We don't have to prove our title. Their constitution is British law, approved by the British House of Parliament. So it would affect British citizens, but not our people. Our people have our ancient law. In fact, our continental common law is the oldest common law on earth. And that needs to be respected. Can I ask a question and while you mentioned that? If, if there's an Australian continental common law, and considering the nature of common law, that it can't be extinguished, and it's argued and it's used and applied, then shouldn't the judges in the courts in Australia 
under the conflict of laws rules, shouldn't they be using the continental common law of Australia? Absolutely. That's shouldn't a they must. Require? Because they, they cannot introduce a law that undermines that common law. They are compelled to use it. As you say, Dr. Gary, it's, it, it cannot be um, extinguished. Mm. And neither, neither can our allodial title be extinguished. I hate to interrupt because that's a huge thought that we really have to think about. Yes. The, the conflict of laws within and between nations standing on the same land I think is an absolutely fabulous concept that we all need to think about more. Um, I think we can thank our guests. I it's change because it's so much easier, but thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing more from you. I'll take a moment to say that we will be doing a workshop in, later on in the year on Indigenous empowerment through law. That's the next topic. So I've used you shamelessly as a hook to our next event. <laughs> um, thank you very much. If I could Thank invite you for this Professor Wyatt. Thank you.